Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Now today, I'm really excited to be speaking with Gordon McClellan. Gordon, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Thank you, Dan. Excited to be here. Great to have you on. Why don't we start by getting you to introduce yourself to the Sports Psych Show audience. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gordon McClellan, CEO and founder of Working With Parents in Sport. Uh, I have a 20-year background in coaching, teaching, uh, education. Uh, And over the last few years, uh, my own experiences as a um, sports parent out in the uh, big world uh, led us to set up um, working with parents in sport. Uh, And it's been a real, um, I guess, labour of love and, and something that we're very passionate about. So you're you're a coach on a day to day basis? Yeah, so I'm still coaching. Uh, I'm still a director of sport uh, in a school. Uh, I still manage the manage. I'm able to manage the two roles, um, and I think it's quite. You know, coaching was the thing that that I got into at a, a at a very young age. Uh, you know, after becoming injured as a as a player, um, probably when I'm happiest actually is is out on the paddock working with uh, working with players. So it's it's still really nice to for that to be a big part of my um, life as well as doing the the parents in sport piece. And so, I mean, you've mentioned there that the parents in sport stems from your experiences in coaching. Um, uh, negative experiences, positive experiences, a, mi- a mix of both? Yeah, I th- I, look, I think there's always going to be a mixture of both, isn't there? I mean, d- over the years from a, a coaching point of view, and I've been very fortunate that, that you know, I, I started by coaching men. I've done my coaching career in reverse, Dan. So I was a sort of young level three rugby coach, you know, in my early 20s, was coaching men at 25. I was then doing some elite under 18 stuff with, with many of those players going on to play uh, pr- professional rugby and then sort of work my way down, so to speak, only in terms of age groups um, to work in the under 13 age groups. And again, I've been really fortunate, coached a couple of teams to sort of national uh, rugby sevens titles uh, over the years. And now I work, you know, from the under six to under 13 age group. So it, it, I've had a, a really good spread of, of seeing the sporting journey through through lots of different lenses. And throughout that career, yes, had some really positive moments with parents. Yeah. And of course, um also had some challenges, which I, I think most coaches would, would acknowledge that they have. We'll get on to the critical essentials, what you feel to be the critical essentials uh, for building positive relationships with parents. But um, you've you've dealt with, you've experienced um, parents from a coaching perspective. Who are the toughest parents? What 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 specific challenges are the toughest challenges uh, that you find to deal with? Oh, you know, on, on a personal level, um, and then actually sometimes, you know, now you sort of do this piece and actually have a chance to reflect over the years. Some of the issues were probably caused by some of my management of the environment myself as a coach. But I guess, you know, when parents maybe deliver conflicting messages to their children, some of the uh, philosophy, some of the things that you're trying to work on with individuals, they maybe don't quite understand as well. So, of course, the the player ends up um, getting the mixed messages. The reality is that every parent probably has a... (laughs) Uh, thinks their child is better than maybe they actually are, but we're allowed to do that because we're we're parents. Um, but I think that sometimes that behaviour where they, let's say, are more outcome-driven um, presents its issues when I think that, you know, I'm a big believer in, in getting the processes and building blocks right. I think when people are just so focused on the outcome, I, I, I don't like that level of conflict. And then I think... You know, just some of those, you know, emails you get, those late night emails, those texts over the years that come totally out of the blue um, with people criticizing everything. And, you know, when parents get emotional, not only do they um, sort of maybe bring up 
the the thing that's concerning them that at that stage but then they also bring up uh, lots of other things to to go with it and uh, and you know you can't not take things you know personally i think you get better with age at, uh, at handling some of those situations as a coach um but but you can't not take it personally because you want people to uh, enjoy the environments that you're creating and the programs you're creating and hopefully see the value in what you're coaching. What I heard you say there, conflicting messages, unrealistic expectations, parents who are overly outcome-driven, challenging communications, whether by email or by text. Let's imagine that, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to touch on those specific areas again. Let's imagine I'm a coach. And I'm a coach of, look, it could be under 11s, it could be under 14s, it could be under 16s. But I'm I'm a coach of of young sports participants. Where Where do I even start in terms of building critical essentials related to building positive relationships with parents? You know, what are those critical essentials? Where do I start? How do I start? I'm a young coach. Advise me here. Yeah, it's interesting that you say the uh, the young coach piece, Dan, because we, we do little bits of work in universities with young coaches because actually they're the ones that I have the greatest um, sympathy for, I guess, in terms of feeling that they get involved in the, the coaching journey and maybe are not equipped with some of these skills. And, you know, and if you're really young and you've never been a parent and we, we look at all the technical and tactical aspects of, of coaching with them, and then what we don't realise is that we've got these young 19 and 20 year olds going out onto a pitch and we've almost, we could have 10 parents sort of baying for blood or baying for outcomes or expecting things. And we're expecting young people to be amazing at engaging and articulating and, and building these relationships with parents, which we know can be so positive and, and it can be a real challenge. Um, I think that the, the one thing that, that strikes me um, whenever we work with with coaches, is actually just the starting mm. attitude, just the starting point that generally, because we've always remember the worst case scenarios, or we remember the time that we've been stung by parents, or we perhaps see things in the media uh, that are highlighted where the parents have gone completely off the end of the scale, and you know, aren't parents the worst thing um, in the world? I think as coaches it's probably led us to having a a slightly sort of negative view of parents in the first place before we even we actually even start and i think we've got to understand that that parents have the biggest influence on their children um that actually mm-hmm. if we use them as allies and we can work together it's always going to be in the best interests of the of the person that we're that we're coaching so i think that and understanding where parents come from, you know, some of the pressures that they face in today's world, you know, because remember there, if you haven't got a, let's say, a sports coaching background, sports science background, sports psychology background, and you're a parent, and there's definitely not a manual for parents, uh, just for general parenting, there's certainly not a manual for sports parenting. I think that we assume that parents maybe know more than they actually do. And I think that we assume that because we know it, they should know it as well. And if they don't know it, then we can, you know, maybe as coaches sometimes we struggle to, to understand that. So I think we've got to understand them, their context, their backgrounds, you know, what, what are they involved in? Because if it's not sport, then I think we've got to do a greater job at painting the picture of what the sporting journey may look like. What I'm hearing you say there is that that journey starts, that relationship with parents starts with my attitude as a coach, which kind of has a self-awareness piece there, being aware of the biases I bring to the table maybe from previous experience, maybe from something I've read, maybe from just a general attitude I have maybe towards sports parents. It then continues uh, into a knowledge of the parents who are in your program. Um, Who are they? What context, what culture, 
uh, background, etc., that they 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 come from or they've experienced. Um, so it's a, it almost feels like a knowledge of self and a knowledge of the parent. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And and one thing I didn't add on the end of that, Dan, was that if the parents aren't painted that picture, their natural response is going to be. Well, I will take it either from the experiences that I had as a child growing up on my sporting experience, how I was maybe coached, how I was maybe taught, or probably in the, I guess, in, in society now is how sport um, is perceived on TV or how the media maybe portrays sport. And we all know that the professional game is very different from people who are coaching at younger ages and the young people's game. Um, and I think that's where some of those behaviours that we may be see in professional sports sometimes gets carried down from parents because they think that's the most effective way to support children at a younger age. So if it starts with knowledge of me, it starts with knowledge of the parent and it's being mindful of the parental attitude towards sports, sports participation, sports engagement, sports, I suppose competitiveness as well, which as you've mentioned there, can be borrowed from what they see on TV. Um, where do I start in terms of building an education program here? I mean, I'm this new young coach. I'm taking over my under 15s. Uh, my my knowledge of me suggests that I'm look. I'm open minded. I, I I know I'm quite comfortable and confident around parents. I'm I'm accessible. Um, I'm starting to meet the parents that um, are involved in my program. What yeah. what now? Does it start with some meetings? How do I how do I engage them? How do I build that relationship? Yeah, I think we want to have a personal relationship. I think it's good that if we get to that get to know their names, so they're not just Johnny's dad. Um, I think we need to include them in our sort of general philosophy. I think as part of our coaching, we need to be uh, making ourselves available um, to speak to them. Now that will come on to a sort of communication policy in a moment, but making ourselves available now. I'll hear coaches saying, no, Gordon, no, 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 because this is just a nightmare because then if we make ourselves available, we have to talk for an hour about little Johnny and, and everything else. And I get it, Dan, you know, over the years, it, it's a nightmare when it generally is the same parent who takes your time. We haven't got always got the time as coaches. And, you know, I, I openly have a good laugh, laugh with coaches in workshops when I say, look, I've pretended to be on the phone to avoid a parent over the years. I'm not going to claim to be perfect on this piece um, at all. But I think that comes down to a, uh, a really clear sort of communication policy. And as you touched on there, I think that starts with um, running a, you know, a really effective parents meeting. Yep. Uh, opportunities where you get to uh, build that relationship. Uh, perhaps uh, parents have to have a voice in that as well. I mean, one thing we've learned from uh, from going out and talking to parents is even the setup of the room can have a, a negative impact before you've even started because some parents come into environments like that. They're, all, always, they're already maybe slightly fearful that they're perhaps because whenever we mention parent ed you know parent education and I never use the word education I don't know how much you look at our stuff but we never use the word education it's always around engagement because you know who am I to stand there and say I'm going to educate you as parents you know and I'll always say that as a disclaimer at the start of my my workshops you know I'm, I'm not here to educate you and I'm certainly not here to tell you how to parent because that just isn't cool so I think if we're setting up rooms, it has to be in a way where it doesn't feel like we're taking the parents back to school, where the person stands at the front and the parents sit like sort of naughty children in the in the class and we're talking to them and it's all our dialogue. So I think those parents meetings, yes, we have to do a lot of the talking because we're trying to explain what's going on. But I think opportunities for them to have a voice, share ideas, speak to other parents um, just allows that that sort of parents meeting to work a little bit more effectively. And I, I, I think that's a, a really, really good starting point. However, I'm also conscious then that people think, OK, well, I've done my parents meeting at the beginning of the year. Oh, that means I'll pull out that set of notes at the same time next August. 
it's a bit like the the code of conduct that we get, which I'm not a big fan of. And I, I'm not a big fan of the content of codes of conduct because I absolutely agree with a lot of the behaviours that, that we're hoping we'd, we'd like to see. The problem is that it's very much in that mould of don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, uh, sign it. And then parents then sort of scrumple it up, put it in the glove box. Three weeks later, nobody ple- is policing the code of conduct. And actually, then it comes out the same time the following year, just like the parents meeting notes. So I, I think there's got to be a, an ongoing um, communication once you've established uh those connections in the parents meeting shared some ideas either in our own behaviors as coaches in terms of how we maybe reinforce those with what we're doing on a on a ground level but also through uh, a very clear um communication policy which we all need to set up as uh, as coaches and and that communication policy needs to be really well thought out you know what type of information are we going to share with parents can we be consistent you know each week can we share our logistical information uh, at the same time every week so parents know that it's coming what's over communicating and what's under communicating well i never think you can over communicate they might not read anything but i never think you can over communicate um, you know if you want to share content that may be backs up your club's philosophy, your philosophy, some of the ideas that you've maybe already shared with your parents, maybe from a, a, an external voice, and the methods of your communication. Because there's no doubt in for me, there's nothing wrong with the, uh, the email message for logistics or the text message or the WhatsApp groups um, for sharing what is just basic organizational information. Likewise, there's nothing wrong with sharing Facebook and Twitter for sharing blog posts, media that you feel you want to share to enhance the, uh, the experience of your group. But then there's a couple of things within this where I think we have to go face to face. You know, I think that we, we can, uh, you know, at sessions, we can thank parents, say thank you for bringing the kids to give up, you know, huge amounts of time. I think we can probably spend a quick 20 seconds on the way of saying, oh, I thought they did well that tonight, or I thought they did that, that better than last week. I thought they were working really hard there. And, and, and something that the parents will maybe then go away uh, and talk to their um, children about. Um but then providing an opportunity ongoing, not all the time, where we are available for a slightly longer conversation, for a quick check-in, a quick update, if parents want to take you up um, on that opportunity. Setting those boundaries is really important because we shouldn't be being disturbed on Sunday night watching Wild at Heart or Paul Dark by a parent calling us as a coach because I think they've overstepped those boundaries then because unless it's something absolutely urgent, I think there's got to be uh, a greater understanding of when when's appropriate and when's maybe not appropriate. Um, but, you know, I have to I talk to parents and try and help parents with this as well because we get so passionate and emotional at times and, you know, we're sat in the evening and we've got things through and going through our head and, and we're not happy with something and we're wrestling with our own emotions. We're wrestling with our children who maybe are struggling with something or we, we're not happy with something that we've seen. And then we maybe blast out these emails that, that probably once we've calmed down, perhaps slept on it the following day, we maybe regret sending. Um, and I, I just think something around, you know, when you're available, uh, what if you think there's a bit of an issue? What's the sort of way this is going to look? How can we make this work effectively with each other? I, th- I think there's a, a, a lot to think about in there. And the face to face when you're delivering bad news, any parent who is getting bad news about their child, it's really difficult to take. But I think what's even more difficult to take is when that comes via a text message or an email, that we totally can misinterpret a message. We've all done that before, where we read an email or a text and take it totally the wrong way um, that it was intended, because you can't see the 
empathy perhaps or the emotion that the that the coach or the individuals putting in with it when sharing the information about about your child so i think the communication piece is huge i hope that answers a few things it answers a lot i mean one of the things i was considering there as you were speaking um, going in a little bit more granular that first meeting is a great opportunity to lay down some and even co-create those boundaries that you've spoken about, especially around access. Um, And I I mean, please come back at me if you feel I'm wrong here, but I I think it can be a negotiation. It can be a co-creation. You you could even, I just, I just want to, I mean, probably being a, a typical sports psychologist here, but I wonder if actually, doing a group activity and asking the parents to come up with what they feel are are reasonable boundaries uh, to be able to uh, gain access to you could be a nice little way to uh, create create those boundaries essentially rather than you sort of saying well I'm only going to be available between these times let them create that Uh, of course it's then a negotiation because if they're saying well we're not going to let you watch pole dark on a sunday night and you've got to be be available to to speak to us that's completely unreasonable but actually engaging them in that process might might be useful i'd I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that idea um but also uh, boundaries and the voice their voice this is where i think it's so challenging because you've got parents who appreciate different types of or different levels of engagement uh you've got parents with different attitudes towards their participation in their child's sport you've got parents with different attitudes to what sport means to them their family their child etc so access i feel almost like you can be quite concrete there whereas voice that is very much mediated by the attitude the parent brings to the table what's your thoughts there yeah i mean look i think the i mean you've hit the nail on the head haven't you but i think the reality is we're talking about giving the parents a voice which is already a far greater um, thing than is actually going on in lots of parts of the world Mm. is actually that opportunity you know, we one of the things that we do in every parents' workshop is list the best bits about being a sports parent, list the biggest challenges, yep. and then share your ideas. And suddenly, you don't feel alone because you realise that actually the vast majority of people are, are feeling the same way as you. And parents feel a lot better from being able to share what their struggles and what their positives are. And that sharing of, of ideas, or even the opportunity to talk about their their child you know we we use trivial pursuit cards in ours where we give the parent a trivial pursuit card and it just looks really cool I mean it's not really trivial pursuits but the six questions are basically about their child and we get them to fill in the back of the trivial pursuit card and immediately um, when we get those back in as a coach we already know six things about their child in terms of maybe how they are, what they like away from the sport, what they like doing, you know, other times in the week, what they maybe struggle with, what they find best about the sporting experience. And I think parents then feel, oh, somebody's interested. And as from a coaching point of view, it's brilliant because actually the parents know their kids better than we do as coaches. And actually, this is a really quick fire way without them realizing that they've done anything formal, um, that I can get some information about everybody that I'm working with. And I think the skill in facilitating those meetings where parents feel safe, share some feedback, but not necessarily formal feedback where they're all going to then just not say anything because they're worried about the ramifications for their child. I think that skilled facilitation of that is really valuable because it can help us shape programs either for, from an organisational culture piece or from a from a coach ed point of view. In your experience, should co- should parents be allowed a voice to question efficacy of coaching? Standards of co- coaching, quality of coaching. Yes, because I think I think we should always be able to challenge everything if we don't like what we necessarily see. I think how we go about that is important to me as well. I think that that's got to be set up in a way where a really effective discussion um, 
can take place. I I think from a parent's perspective, I think it's really important that we give them the chance to explain how they see it from their perspective and try and listen to what they're saying. Mm. Now, I'll be the first to admit over the years that as a coach, as a parent is sometimes telling me some things, I'm immediately thinking about defending my corner and what I'm going to say next rather than actually listening to what the specific issue is within their context. And I think if we can really listen, we can actually don't always have to agree with everything that that we're hearing, but sometimes as well, even those conversations, if we're prepared to have them, can actually give us some really good information for how we may do something differently next time. It could be a little bit of our communication that hasn't been right. It could be just something that, oh, yeah, they've got a fair point there. That that probably didn't look great when it's, when it's explained like that and maybe help us um, shape it moving forward. So, yes, I think they should be able to challenge, but I think – that should be set up in a way where the parents understand what that that's got to look like from their point of view. Coaches have, have we've got to do a bit of work on that on that um, setting up of uh, of that dialogue because you know I always say to parents if you're going to talk to your child's coach, it's got to be about your child. It's not about everything else. It's about your child and their journey because so often parents bring into conversation other people and other people's parents. So I think there's lots to think about in that. Well. So straight away, reflecting back to you, there's a boundary. Yeah. You met, you mentioned at the end there, a, 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 a boundary can be a parent is only uh, a, a allowed to ask questions. I'm using strong, probably inappropriate language there, but let, let's just go with it. Uh, allowed to, to ask questions from a coaching perspective around their child, not other children not other participants that can be a boundary in and of itself but i I, see i think this is where it comes really interesting and and actually really interesting in developing coaching skills because you've talked about listening uh the uh, and the importance of listening which is an important coaching skill anyway you know when i go back to um the work of say stephen rolnick motivational interviewing he's been on the show and he talked about the importance of empathy and uh, that empathy isn't necessarily when you empathize with someone you're not necessarily agreeing with them but you're engaging in listening and then you're delivering a listening statement what i hear you say is this you know what i think you're experiencing in my coaching uh, culture is this or what your child is experiencing is this so what i hear you say gordon from all your experience uh talking with coaches about this talking with parents is that parents should probably be given the facility to ask questions about your coaching the efficacy of your coaching the way that you're coaching and that coaches are probably best served listening potentially empathizing, asking further questions, getting greater detail, being open-minded enough to accept that the parent may have a point or may be correct in this instance, but giving the parent the opportunity to say their piece um, and then you can respond appropriately. And that might be agreeing, but it, it also might be saying, well, I'm coaching from this perspective. I'm coaching rather than just dismissing, them, rather than just, you know, cutting them off straight away. Am I understanding you correctly there? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, there's, t- there's two things just from from you sort of summarising uh, my ramblings, I guess, that, that listening to that is that the the one of the things we say to coaches whenever you deliver a message to parents is is that parents like you to be honest with them, but you can be honest with empathy. Because there there is going to be times where we may have to deliver news that a parent doesn't like. That parent isn't going to particularly like us at that stage. We're not going to be top of the Christmas card list. But I think if we've done lots of things really well before around how we've engaged them in the environment, I think as parents begin, the heads begin to clear and they realise the empathy that we care for their children and the progress that they've made, I think then that it it settles down um, much quicker 
um, than it maybe would if if that wasn't already uh, in place. But I think the efficacy of the, the coaching one for me, I think the reality is the vast majority of parents, if you spoke to them, particularly, let's say, at grassroots level, Dan, is that if they turn up and they've made such an effort to get their child to their sport and they're paying money and they've screeched out of the car park at the petrol station and spilt the cost of coffee uh, all over the knee and they've worried about another child in the back and they've had to send someone to do that. I think if we're delivering, you know, if we're there on time and we this is, and this is basic coaching isn't it? and we look organised and it's really well thought out and the children are active and they're all involved with the equipment and they're not studying lots of lines and we're giving really good feedback and parents can see that we're giving feedback to different players so they feel that it's been worth it and the children are getting something out from it. And they see all that really good role modelling from us as coaches in our in our behaviours and how we speak with the children, how we set up our environments, how we speak with the parents on the on the on the way off. I think the reality is that I don't <laughs> touch wood, I'm, I'm trying to think back. I don't think anybody has ever challenged me on the efficacy of my coaching. I think they've challenged me on the bits around it, maybe some of my communication or why why I've maybe done done this or done that. But I don't remember from a direct coaching point of view anybody questioning my approach to how I do my coaching itself. I suppose I'm 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 coming at this from when I say efficacy of coaching, I am also referring to the 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 psychosocial skills so the communication I, I i suppose gordon for me this becomes absolutely as i say i think this whole topic is is interesting it's an ongoing challenge and in some in some environments it's the biggest challenge um i think it becomes really fascinating when you really put a microscopic viewpoint on coaching environments and that relationship between coaches and parents the interplay and and i just as you were speaking i i i wrote down a line and at one end i put down ignore and at the other end i put down language skills and these are not opposites but historically i've had coaches say to me well i just ignore parents on the other hand i i've interacted with coaches who say no i bring i bring parents in you know i you know they're they're a part of it you think oh fantastic great but when you examine some of the conversations they're having it's just potentially their language and communication skills aren't quite uh, at a level whereby they're able to deal with some of the challenges that parents bring to the table and that's i think where something like motivational interviewing the 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 listening skills the questioning the empathy etc could be so important as well as those things improving your coaching per se um so i i I, i'm i'm sure the for me in my experience the majority of the complaints i've heard from parents have been more around the communication piece the psychosocial pieces rather than well i don't think that coach x should be playing the you know he shouldn't be he or she shouldn't be coaching the ball coming out the back and it should be just direct and so it, it, it's kind of the psychosocial areas i think where where parents a lot of parents sort of seem to have a, a a problem with 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 some of their coaches that's just been my experience yeah i think i think i think that's i think that's um very accurate um and yet what do we spend the vast majority of time doing in in Coaching qualifications. We spend most of the time whenever we've got a tech tax session. It's it's um, absolutely full, isn't it? And then when we have some of the other bits around the side of it, which would actually make that even more effective, it's probably less well attended. I'm not so that's a very general point of view, but that would be my, that would be yeah. my guess around the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. How can I let's let's broaden this a little bit? So we talked about the coach parent relationship. What about the organization parent relationship, the academy parent relationship, the club parent relationship? I suppose this leads on to policy. Um, When you deliver to organizations, clubs, academies, what are the main points here that uh, academies, clubs, organizations should be considering when it comes to their policies their relationship with parents how how you know what what questions come up what things you talk about with organizations 
yeah, I mean, you've you've hit the nail on the head because if we um, if we split this into just organisation on its own, coach on its own, parent on its own, then yeah. we can't expect any parental engagement program to be effective. And I loved your um, episode last week on culture. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to that because it just, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll, ju- I'll just nip into that one or just about organizational culture and how everybody needs to, you know, have a responsibility um, for that. And I think, that, you know, that could not be, you know, any better put than the fact that organization, coach and parent need to be completely aligned. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to go in with the organizations, whether that be an NGB, whether that be the, be a club. And ask some very honest questions. You know, if we were looking at what a, a perfect parent culture would look like, do we do this? Do we do that? And 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 I think we've sort of got 10, 11 things that, that we work through. Whilst also getting the clubs and the academies to acknowledge that they need to have that right attitude to parents, which we talked about um, at the beginning of this piece. But then also taking the view that they're actually responsible for their coaches. And it's no good having this culture where we say, this is all about development. This is how we're going to communicate with parents. This is how we're going to engage with you. This is the picture that you're going to see as parents. If on eight of our 10 pitches in the academy, the coach is a role model in those behaviors, and then on the other two pitches, we're seeing something that's totally conflicting. Because I think the moment that we have conflicting messages or parents see different things going on um, with different coaches within the same environment, I think that causes confusion. Um, so I think the, the, the this is why we work in three pieces, the organisational piece. We then get to do the coach education piece, which obviously we've talked a lot about today, whilst speaking to coaches about embedding what the organisation are trying to do. And then actually the coaches are just gatekeepers of that wider culture. They're no more than that. They're they're merely gatekeepers. And I think that actually helps the coaches out at this stage because particularly those younger coaches, they're always protected by some form of seniority above them. And I think that gives them the freedom to go and do some of the things and, and, and learn some of these skills as they're coaching and maybe getting more experience, that there's always somebody who's part of the organisational piece who could maybe help them out, take on some of the bits that they find more challenging. And once we've got those lined up, well, then we can go to a parent and we can start saying to a parent, look, this is what we do here. This is what we expect to see. This is what you'll see when you come and join us, because we all know how humans like to conform to the environments that they find you know we very rarely get people wanting to do something completely different you know we're serving at Wimbledon match point you don't get three people singing a football song in the in the stand you know we're all behaving because that's you know that's the environment that that's set up and that's what's expected and I think once that's consistent you've got a chance but you know coaches then for example, this is one for me and, and one I do feel strongly about, but I understand the, the challenges of this. You know, if we've told parents, for example, not to start yelling instructions at their children and joysticking them around the field, I don't think we can really stand there as coaches and then be shouting an instruction every three seconds, even though that might be what we perceive we see on the TV. Because I think if we do that, we've given carte blanche for parents behind to follow suit. And I think it's the same thing with officials as well. I think that if we're shouting stuff that's negative and derogatory towards officials as coaches, which I I really hope we're not when we're dealing in youth sport here, I'd I'd, I'd be really, um, and I know it happens, but, you know, that's just disappointing anyway. Then I think that we basically, again, given parents the carte blanche to, to follow suit. So I think the coach behavior and role modeling of the organizational culture is a really important piece in the parent engagement program. I suppose challenging you fractionally there, I, I just I I can kind of envision myself having a conversation with a coach who joysticks players around the pitch and talking to him or her about the importance of modeling behavior because he or she wouldn't want 
the parents to behave like that, joysticking their children around the pitch. That coach might say to me, well, hang on a minute, Dan. I'm the expert here. For example, I might have that coach might say, I've got 30 years of coaching experience. These parents don't. So I've got every right to joystick these players around the pitch. They don't. So that, I, I, there's a question in that as to what a good response to that might be. Yeah, I, I, hey, yeah. I'll, I'll answer that, Dan. But, I mean, very happily, I would hope after 30 years of coaching, we'd realise that, that players have to make their own decisions. And there's a difference between joysticking and a difference between really good feedback at the appropriate time to encourage our players on the field. And I would hope as part of good coaching practice that that delivery of feedback is our sort of job or role as a coach. And we have got the experience and we are trying to help our players. But I think when I'm using that word joysticking, I'm talking about where every single decision is mapped out for every player on a field and it's a it's a consistent decision. Do you know what I mean? I think that's my use of joysticking as opposed to giving some directional information, you know, at appropriate times as a, a game or training sessions going on. And and being a sports psychologist, I would, hey, you have me at hello here. I 100% agree. Absolutely. Um, I suppose, again, I, I'm looking granular at academies, you know, talking with coaches on a day-to-day basis having been in an academies at clubs i understand the nuance and the challenges that let's say directors that heads of departments in these clubs in these academies face um and i suppose my question leads on to um because you you could always get pushed back from a coach and say well my philosophy is that i can actually be very directive um because of X, Y, Z, because that person is a very cognitive coach, because they believe in an instructional approach to, to coaching. Um, I'm with you, but I know what kind of pushback one can get. Um, if I'm ahead of an academy and I'm trying to put down policies related to parent-coach relationships and... Um, I want my coaches to get along with parents, to drive great relationships with parents. But I've got a single coach who happens to be, for instance, a really good coach, very experienced. And when I say really good coach, you know, helps develop players. Um, And maybe the engagement piece isn't quite there because that coach says, well, look, I'm just here to, to not drill them, but you know uh, help them develop their game and so their interpersonal skills the psychosocial side isn't as important to them and there's many many coaches out there who have that philosophy um i get pushed back all the time from coaches who go well i don't buy into that i'm i'm just here to develop uh, a player's game yeah going back to that director of football how does that director of football or how does the, the director of the academy deal with that? Can they compromise? Do you think? Yeah, and look, I think I think there's, I think the one thing we need to establish first. I mean, we're talking about the academy environment here compared to, let's say, the grassroots environment. I think the one good thing I, I've got a son in a in a football academy, so I understand the the nature of it pretty well. Yeah, but take take, um, take grassroots as well. I mean take a club, a, a grassroots club could yeah. have in in the UK could have 600 players. A grassroots club in the US could have it would function slightly differently. They could have 10,000 players. You're going to have a few hundred coaches. You're going to have different attitudes from different coaches. Yeah. How much I think this is fascinating Gordon. How much does one compromise? I've said football, it could be basketball, it could be baseball, whatever. Yeah. You know, how much does one compromise? I think there's going to have to be some compromise, as you say, because some people have never had a relationship with parents and have never included that in their sort of coaching philosophy. And I, I, it is a relatively new piece, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd like to think over the last few years, we've tried to make it a little bit cool and trendy that it's something that's talked about, or hopefully we've raised some some awareness um, with the piece. I think I still go, if, if we're talking about that direct example about the joysticking, I still don't believe that that's good coaching. I think we, we probably, most of the coaches that listen on here will probably take that piece. In terms of their attitude towards parents, I think that can be difficult to shift. 
I think we probably do have to compromise. But I think what we've got to do then as the organisation is be aware well, obviously provide the training, obviously provide the CPD, obviously provide the support or provide the ongoing support. You know, keep mentioning it as part of the the, the sort of general organisational culture, I guess, so to speak. But I think if we highlight that we've got individuals who aren't buying into this piece and really find it challenging, then I think that's where if they're massively strong in other areas, just as we would in, in, I guess, in any form of business, I think we've then got to support them in that area. So maybe that's where we can put somebody who's higher up the club or somebody who is good at, at these things to maybe spend a bit of time around their environment, just plugging a few, a, a few of those holes. Yeah, brilliant. I, I mean, I loved, I loved the notion of ongoing support. You alluded to my podcast with Suze Burton Wiley on culture. And I'm asking these questions because I just think it's a fascinating area that has no simple answer. She talked about culture as something we have or something that we are. And so something culture is something we have. The, that culture is there to be manipulated. It's there to be changed and constructed to what we think the optimal culture is. Whereas culture defined as something that we are is more to be looked on and appreciated for similarities and differences and so if we do have a big grassroots club academy um, organization with 50 75 100 coaches even 20 coaches involved we're going to have similarities and differences and it's how much do we compromise on differences and I love your notion of we still have to keep providing the CPDs we still have to keep probing asking questions providing information evidence Um, I think while supporting not encouraging differences but maybe Gordon while supporting this notion of this could be a really good coach who perhaps has a different viewpoint a different lens when it comes to relationship with parents um, I mean, I don't think bullying parents or anything like that is ever acceptable. So I'm not saying that, but just somebody who says, well, I actually, I, I take more of a standoffish approach. Um, and, and we just need to understand that and understand why he or she has come to that conclusion and what that actually looks like in practice and where that helps, where that hinders, where it's effective, where it's ineffective. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I look when I started coaching 20 years ago, Dan, I was very much in that camp. Leave me to it. Mm. It's nothing to do with you. Gordon knows everything (laughs) and I'm 23, which was just the most shocking thought process ever in the world. Quite why I'm still here doing it now is beyond me. But I think you um, evolve on your coaching journey. I think my relationship with parents then over the years um, got a little bit better in terms of you realise that, hang on a minute, no, that isn't right either. And actually, they're very supportive and actually they're committing a lot of time and the children are loving this. And actually, isn't this good? Particularly when it's easy, when it's going well, isn't it? You know, you can all enjoy those relationships and things when, when things are going well. It's when it's not going as well. Um, that can be a challenge. But do you know what? For me, the biggest thing was becoming a parent and it just completely transformed my whole view on it because I was sat there with two young children out playing grassroots sport just taking them as any parent would just to get them involved in physical activity Uh, I had the most bizarre thing uh, done where I was handed a card by a scout when my son was three even with my background in education I sat there in a village hall and just was Sort of, I don't know what I thought actually. I mean, it's a long time ago now. I mean, it's a miracle he's still in the academy. I mean, he is 12, um, so that's a miracle in itself. Um, he was, yeah, handed a card mm. and I walked out and I had that sort of immediate excitement, you know, oh, how cool is this? I couldn't wait to ring my wife and couldn't wait to ring grandparents. Oh, this is brilliant. Guess what? They think that our sons are, you know, amazing. And I'm thinking, Gordon, he's three. Gordon, he's three. Gordon, you know this. You've got a sports science degree. He is three. So this sort of carried on for, you know, the next few years. And he just did grassroots football. And then he it, it, it sort of ended up in some kind of pre-academy stuff. And people were then, you know, in this rat race for these nine-year-old football contracts, which is, you know, another experience in it, it, it itself and, and, and watching this. 
And you know what? There were times over those years, even though with the background in sport, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, I need to know more about that. I really could do with some support here. The way I'm feeling about it, how I perceive it, I'm in conflict with my own views, what other people are doing, what other parents are doing, the pressure from this, the pressure from that. And I went to start having a look to find information. And yes, I could find bits scattered over sites all over the world in different contexts. And I just couldn't find one place where I felt that there was really good support available. Mm. And then my thought process is, well, like, we need to do something about this because if I'm struggling as somebody who's got a sports background, there must be millions of parents out there who are just finding this an absolute nightmare or really challenging or going through the same feelings, the same emotions that, that I'm going through. And then it was like, well, how do we set this up in a way where it can have maximum impact? And you know, being a Liverpool supporter, which is obviously particularly tragic after last night's result. Um, so I'm surprising I'm on such good form with you this morning. But I always said that whenever we wrote content or anything we produced, everybody in the middle of Merseyside had to be able to understand it. That it, they had to either be able to read it, reflect, or have felt that emotion or felt that, that experience. They didn't have to agree with everything that working with parents in sport put out, but at least it stirred an emotion and at least they could relate and at least they could have a, a, a conversation. And then, as you say, you think about, well, hang on, if that's going to have a big impact, okay, we get some really cool content, try and break down the science, you know, make it, put it into context, make it really real life, was then, well, it's also got to be affordable because, it's no good, for example, us providing this level of support if we're charging £300 for something or we're charging things. So the pricing structure of working with parents in sport was a pie and a pint. So we had this we had this whole idea that it had to be understood by everybody and it had to be affordable at the cost of a pie and a pint. And I think that even that understanding of... I guess the the journey we've been on has actually sort of maybe gives people a few ideas for for parental engagement in general. I love it, and as as you're speaking there, I, I you know I'm reflecting on all the whole of our conversation in many respects, and it, it's it's making me think of the complexity of human beings and the complexity of human relationships. As you're speaking there, I'm thinking you know if I'm a coach, I have to or it's useful to appreciate that not only does the child bring with them uh, a complexity in terms of an interaction between their biology, psychology, and environment, which is enormously complex in and of itself, but then the child's parents brings with them that same complexity, but also the additional notion of the complexity between the pe- what the parent would like for their child what experience they want for their child etc cetera, etc cetera. and we're trying to you know what you're trying to do is you're is you're trying to create a platform where you have created a platform that says well look we appreciate your experiences we appreciate how you feel what you're thinking um but you're also saying to coaches we appreciate what you're thinking and feeling and experiencing and i think maybe historically that coaches where they've tried to simplify the processes go well i'm just going to ignore this i don't parents go away but it doesn't work because parents are too invested again that complex interaction that complex relationship between parent and child uh they both have different needs wants hopes doubts beliefs expectations etc so you're just trying to cut through things. You're trying to give good advice to coaches, good advice to, to parents, and, and and some good advice in terms of some good ideas in terms of the interaction between everybody, the relationship between everybody and the organisation as well. So you're trying to you're trying to cut through some some serious complexity there, Gordon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and trying to base everything on 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 obviously on science rather than just opinion and and real life experience and 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 breaking that down. Yeah, that that's ultimately you you can come and join the marketing department down here. You do a better job than me. I think you've 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 <laughs> you, you've summed that up better than than how I describe what what we do. But yes, in effect, that that's that's exactly what we're doing. And going back to that point you said about the coaches and 
that ongoing support and the timing things. I do think coaches struggle with the fact that they're busy and they commit huge amounts of time to their actual sessions themselves and the, the logistical piece and the the organizer, organizing of, of matches and everything else that, that goes on with it, that they then find this bit like an, uh, an annoying um, add-on. But, you know, there's a few quick wins for coaches. I mean, we haven't talked about a few quick wins for mm. coaches are things like, you know, sort out your diary. Uh, make sure you've got a really clear play- playing time policy. Uh, make sure your sessions are active and engaging. Be proactive in your communication. Get the more information parents have, the more reassured parents are when they hand over the thing that's most precious to them. And be really clear in why you do everything whether your substitution policy, you say your playing time policy, your your end of season awards, weekly awards, whatever you do as part of that experience, have a very clearly thought out reason why you do it and be prepared to articulate it. And I think if you then communicate well, there's some really quick fixes there that I think probably will not take that much time if coaches actually spent the time to do it and actually would probably save them time at the other end for some of the the dialogue that then goes on during the course of a season or or during the course of a programme. I'm conscious of your time and I've just got a couple more questions. My first one to you is this. The parent who brings their child along and says, my 11-year-old, as an example, loves football and wants to be a Premier League player and I want them to be a Premier League player as well or if we're in the US as an example brings a young basketball player along to practice and says he he wants to play in the NBA I want him to play in the NBA we're bringing him along for this what's your thoughts on that what's your thoughts on parental attitude to I suppose what could be construed as the professionalization of youth sport? Oh, what's my view on it? Goodness. I mean, how does the coach deal with that? Uh, yeah. I th- look, I, yeah, it's challenging, isn't it? I mean, look, when I, I, I'll be really honest, when I deliver our parents workshops, cause I often get asked this question, actually, Dan, you know, I get lots of parents who say I've invested lots of time. I've invested lots of money. Um, how do I know if it's actually been worth it? And I spent a long time thinking about this and I tried to unravel that type of question because that's where the attitude comes from that, you know, if I'm investing this time and money, then there has to be an outcome at the end, whether that be the professional football or the college scholarship. And the reality is that we all know how difficult it is to get into those programs, particularly when we're trying to make decisions pre-puberty as well. I mean, that's a big piece of my thing. I think pre-puberty, we really are doing a lot of guesswork. I, I, I just, I, I really do my experience of trying to do talent ID prior to that. I, I, I just, I just sit uncomfortable. It just sits uncomfortably with me until we've gone through that stage. I think it's hard enough when we get beyond that stage, but I think it's really tricky. And I always say to a parent, I'll tell you how you know if it's been worth it. If you have used the sporting experience as a vehicle to equip your children with the best character and life skills that will allow them to go and thrive in whatever environment they choose to go and be involved in. And I think that the moment that we get parents to reflect on what they want for their kids, the realities of it all, delivered in a nice way, we often get in workshops when we ask parents the question, they never mention that you've just said there, they've come and they've said they want this. Whenever I ask any parents, what are their, pretend to be the genie, uh, the genie in the lamp done at my workshops. You can imagine the different guises I put on, you know, what are your three wishes for your children? And never once do they put professional player, mm. Olympic gold medalist, everything else. They talk about, well, I want them to be happy. I want them to be, have good, uh, be good communicators. I want them to feel part of a team. I want them to develop resilience. I want them to have determination, whatever else. And it's absolutely brilliant because we then say, and how often do our behaviours as parents then reflect that if that's what we're saying we want for our children? And this is where I try to cleverly, whenever they're watching their sporting experience, be putting these building blocks in place 
for the parents to be focusing on the life skills and character of the children. Because you know as well as I do, Dan, that if a child, if we turned up to watch a child play in a football academy this weekend and we saw them being self-organised, we saw them being creative, we saw them being adaptable, we saw them communicating well with, with other players, we saw them showing some determination, some resilience, all these, all these amazing skills. If we saw that, the actual performance is going to be good anyway. On the whole, you would expect to see something pretty positive. And we've tried to get parents to view the sporting experience through that lens in the, in the whole development of their child. And I think it's provided for a lot of parents a release of the pressure valve to actually focus on what, what we really should be celebrating here as, as part of the journey. And I think that I would certainly, if a parent came to me in that and said, look, I said, it's early days, we will provide the environment, we'll provide the programme, we'll work with you, we'll talk to you, we'll paint the picture. These are some of the things that we're going to find, we might find over the next few years, you know, when we deliver parents' meetings, you know. We talk about the ups and downs of the journey, potential, you know, parents avoiding comparisons with other children, particularly at those early ages, or that, you know, not informing yourself brilliantly from reliable sources, you know, not listening to the parent next to you on the balcony who who then sends you into a flat spin and I, and I think we just if it's so well thought out and we say look yes we'll do our best for your child it's great that we've got these aspirations but they must be aspirations not expectations and we will do our best to create this whole individual on the journey I like what you say about asking parents to let's say create a list of the desires they have for their child I suppose oriented towards say character traits and then orienting their focus onto those things and its relationship with your coaching environment and what your coaching environment can deliver over and above outcomes such as college scholarships or you know being becoming a professional Related to everything you've said, my my final question as a sort of an add-on is, do you think there is a line that becomes a point within a coaching environment for a coach to say to a parent, and th this would be very few and far between, I'm, I, I'm sure, but if that parent is quite insistent um, around future outcomes, you know, do you think there's room for coaching environments that you know aren't necessarily about the outcome and just about the experience uh, and that there's room for coaches to say okay I hear what you're saying Mr and Mrs Smith but I feel that our coaching environment isn't going to be for your child because our coaching environment isn't about making professionals, isn't about developing college scholarships. It's about, let's say, well, whatever it's about, the experience. It could still be about learning the sport, of course, but learning and experience. It's just that some coaching environments aren't going to be for some parents. There's got to be a line, surely, where coaches go, hey, we're not for you and you're not for us. Or is that just being defeatist? No, I, no, I, d I don't think so. And I think we all know that there are, there are many different environments and some will be suited to people in context and some, you know, compared to other people. You know, everybody's got their own experiences and own views on it. But you see, you know, maybe this is a, you know, a conversation for another day because, you know, when I talk, when, you know, I go in and talk to, let's say, club coach parent and try and piece those together, I also talk with NGBs. Now, What's their role in making sure that under their umbrella that that's what the environment is in, let's say, all their swimming clubs? That they've created the culture and then the club's coach, parent, do it. Because if we were turning up to a sport or an environment at certain age groups and everybody had, and I know we're talking a perfect world here, Dan. I mean, God, this will take loads of unravelling. But everybody was doing something similar in terms of culture, philosophy, ethos, what the program looks like. You wouldn't have that situation. Yeah. Would you? I mean, you do, it wouldn't exist. I know we'll never get to that stage, but that's the reality of, of 
what we find if that was more set and that's what everybody expected to see but that's what you got everywhere then surely that's a dream for us all to have based on the best science and everything we know about child development absolutely mate yep well said gordon great conversation it's it's nuanced isn't it it really is nuanced and there's so many different mini challenges and tough conversations to have because everybody has their own motivations and trying to get everybody on the same page is i suppose simply impossible to do that perfectly but something like your organization is you know trying to help coaches and parents do that as well as clubs and organizations and national national governing bodies as you've as you've said and i know that your website on your website you've got a wealth of material i know that you've got books so to finish off why don't you just take the sports Soap show audience through what you offer how they can get in contact yeah thank you dan um yeah so our website www.parentsinsport.co.uk as Dan said, there, there's lots of things, podcasts, video recordings. Uh, there's coach education piece for coaches. There's things for organizations to work with. There's obviously resources for parents. Uh, we had one of our new books released last summer called Two Hats, uh, which is specifically for um, parent coaches, uh, which is a, obviously a topic again for another day, Dan, because that brings its own uh, level of challenge if you're coaching your own children. And then we provide uh, webinars, we go out and do workshops uh, for parents at all levels, whether that be grassroots into pathway programs. Same with coaches, we do some basic coach ed, but then we also look at those academy pathway environments with coaches. And then we do work with sports clubs, NGBs, about what is a positive parent culture and, and, and work with them. Uh, work with them in their context again to try and develop uh, the best resources we can. And and the beauty of working with parents in sport websites and resources is that they can be customized by organizations so they can look like they're taking ownership because I'd love them to take ownership of it. They can add their own content. They can change pictures in the books. They can change bits of the resources to make it fit for their sports. And we ultimately just want to raise a, a greater awareness of this piece uh, more than anything else and hopefully have a, a positive impact on, on millions of children and parents who will be uh, setting out on their uh, sporting journeys, hopefully with the best support from, from coaches and the environments that they can find. Brilliant. Gordon, that's awesome. Thank you for everything you do and um, thank you for your time today. Thank you. It's been a real honour. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, thinks. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Psych Show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now. <laughs>